All right, so I will go ahead and get us started. Yeah, as I said, this evening, we're gonna be talking about programming and credits during COVID-19, um, our amazing presenters. Oops, actually. Our amazing presenters are James King from the Ella Baker Center, um, Ella Turin from TPW, and Isla Benjamin also from TPW. And I will um, pass it over to them in a minute so they can introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start off with introductions and then we will move into how programming and credits work in general. So even before you know COVID and this lockdown situation that we're in, what um, opportunities exist for credit earning and program participation. Then um, the folks from DP TBW will take over and talk about the role of community-based organizations and um, what modified programming is looking like now and what ongoing conversations are with CDCR to improve it. And then we'll pass it over to James from the Ella Baker Center who will discuss um, legislative efforts to improve access to programming and credits, namely through AB 3160. And then we will have time for Q&A and wrapping it up. So that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pass it over to the presenters. Maybe if y'all want to go ahead and start with introducing yourselves. And I think Ella, I'll pass it over to you first, um, mostly because I need to find James to unmute. <laughs> No worries. Um, thanks so much uh, for having us here tonight, um, Taina. And I, I really want to thank Initiate Justice for par partnering with us to do this. So excited to be here and so excited to see so many people um, on this webinar. My name is Ella Turan. I'm the California Inside Out um, Prison Exchange Program uh, um, Coordinator for, Cal for the California, for the state of California. It's an international program. Um, and I'm also on the leadership team for the TPW. Um, and I'll pass it quickly over um, to my partner, uh, Ayla, who will introduce her to herself and will tell you really quickly what TPW does or stands for. Bella, my name is Ayla. Um, I'm the executive director for Buddhist Pathways Prison Project. We do meditation programs inside the prisons. We're in about 13 institutions right now. And we correspond with folks, um, you know, anybody who writes to us and wants support with their meditation practice, we uh, supply them with materials and, and mentorship. Um, and then I too am on the leadership team for the TPW. Um, the TPW, TPW stands for Transformative in Prison Work Group. And we are made up of 40 plus community-based organizations that run in prison programs. Um, we fill this unique space that wasn't really being addressed before um, for program providers um, to get together, to organize, and to um, have more collective power, um, especially when negotiating things like programs um, with the CDCR. And ultimately, our vision is ensuring that all people in California prisons have access to meaningful, high quality programs that are transformative. That's why we have that in our name. And we are working towards our North Star goal of de decarceration. Um, so that's kind of what we're about. And hopefully, James is, um, James is on the line and we'll pass the baton to him. Hey, everybody. This is James, and I'm um, excited to be here with Ella and Ayla and Taina and Initiate Justice. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. I'm currently working as state campaigner for the Ella Baker Center for, for Human Rights. I've been home about five, five and a half months. And so I've been looking at programming and, and thinking about programming credits from both sides. Um, just not too long ago, I was a person who was really invested in, in getting into groups and, and, and receiving and, and credit earning. Um, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights is an organization that is working to move resources from the carceral system, from the PIC, and back into communities. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so now we're um, going to go into kind of a high-level overview of programs that are offered inside. 
of prison um, and they're grouped into these four different categories. Um, so the first type of program that we'll talk about are these activity groups. Um, and this I think is, you know, at least when I think of programs, kind of the more common type of program I think of. These are the community-based organizations um, and sometimes programs that are run by folks who are currently incarcerated. Um, some examples of programs that are considered activity groups would be any of the arts and corrections programs. So that's, you know, the Actors Gang, Guitar Doors, um, the William James Association programs, any of the CDCR's innovative grantees, um, which are programs like Inside Garden Program, Guiding Rage Into Power, um, Vogue, the Vogue Program, um, Ahimsa Project, Prison Yoga Project, um, Success Stories, um, et cetera. These are, again, organizations that are typically run by communities. Um, and that's distinctive from the treatment programs, which are primarily run by the CDCR. Um, and then some programs that fall underneath the umbrella of treatment programs would be, um, you know, the cognitive behavioral um, therapies and interventions. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of programs underneath that umbrella. But again, the main distinction there is organization or programs that community run um, or ran by folks inside or um, programs that are run by the CDCR. So the other two types of programs that are, that are housed are educational programs and pre-release programs. And the educational programs um, are sort of your obvious adult education, continuing education, GED, GED classes, and those are usually housed within CDCR, but that also includes post-secondary education. So anybody who's doing AA classes, who's working towards a BA, um, or even sometimes there are folks working towards their master's degrees. Um, all of those classes also cart, uh, count under educational program, as well as library services, general library, as well as law library and research fall under there. Um, and then finally, student support services, which include tutoring and phys ed and um, other types of uh, programs like that. And then finally, the last um, type of program programming are your pre-release programs. Um, and um, those include your California ID card program, which is um, really essential to making sure that folks who are released have an ID card um, when they get out, um, which is essential to gaining access to lots of different kinds of services that um, may be even required um, to be able to be successful on the outside. Um, also, it includes career technical education, looking to develop um, hard skills that can translate into careers like HVAC, electrical, mechanic. Um, and then finally, transition programs, which include things like um, budgeting and looking at um, money matters, um, career development, those sorts of things. So um, when you look at the totality of all of these programs, you can see how um, impactful they would be, whether people are looking for something that is um, around education or around um, personal development or around developing skills. Um, there are really a variety of ways that people can um, be engaged and involved while they're inside. Um, and these, and the important thing to remember about these is that this is a combination of efforts between things that the CDCR offers, things that the state offers, and things that community-based organizations offer as well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, credits and um, how the programs tie in with how you earn credits. And this is a really important piece. Um, and I think James pointed to it a little bit um, ago. When Prop 57 passed, they made it possible to expand the amount of credits that people are earning towards their release. And this is really critical to a lot of folks, um, not only to ensure that they are able to participate in the programs um, and that they are you know, doing things to you know, further themselves in different ways, 
but also because being able to participate in these programs allows folks to um, accumulate um, what we're calling credits, um, which leads to an earlier release. So there are five types. They're listed here, good conduct, extraordinary conduct, milestone, RAC, which stands for rehabilitative um, achievement credits, and educational merit. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Ayla, who's gonna talk about a couple of them, and then I'll talk about the rest of them. Um, so one of the, the good conduct credit, also known as good time credit, um, this is a credit that folks get um, and it's awarded kind of no matter what, unless you have behavioral issues or write-ups. Um, and so, you know, there's a percentage amount of time um, that automatically gets calculated um, when someone becomes incarcerated. Um, and that's the good the good conduct credit. So again, it's awarded um, right off the bat unless there are issues while people are incarcerated. Um, the amount of time goes down even more if you go to fire camp um, and it varies the amount of time that people can earn off, um, varies based on um, if it's a violent crime, um, if it uh, what's considered to be a nonviolent second striker crime. So that would mean um, there was a violent crime in the past, but this current incarceration experience um, was nonviolent. So then you get a little bit less. Um, and then for non serious, nonviolent, you get the most amount of time off and right off the bat. Um, so, you know, as we're thinking about how these um, Credit, how credit earning relates to COVID-19. This is one type of credit that people are still able to earn um, because again, you earn this just right off the bat from um, when you become incarcerated, you only get it taken away. Um, another type of credit that people are able to earn is this extraordinary credit. Um, so for this, you can earn up to one year off of your sentence for an extraordinary service or action in a life-threatening or crucial environment. Um, this is awarded very arbitrarily and gets um, decided who receives these credits and for how much they receive them based on the warden at the institution and then it also has to be approved by um, people at headquarters, CDCR headquarters, the department. Um, and again, that can range from, you know, it's, it's not really clear um, what exactly qualifies as an extraordinary circumstance or extraordinary action. Um, so that's the extraordinary credit. So I'm going to talk about the milestone and rack credits. And the way I like to think about it, um, if you think about it as a timeline, so the milestone credits are for participation in various programs that are approved by the CDCR. Um, and you can earn up to 12 weeks of time in a year's worth of, within a year. Um, so you, but you have to be accumulating the time and the hours by participating in the programs and that's how you earn, earn the milestone credits. Whereas the educational merit credits they are awarded upon the completion of a degree. Like when you get a GED, if you get an, a, an AA degree, if you get a BA degree, you can earn educational merit um, up to six months of that. And, but the, the tricky part is that um, I know a lot of folks who I know who have multiple AA degrees and you can only earn the educational merit for the first time you get it. Um, so even if you have three, you're, you're not getting three um, educational merits for every AA degree you have. You only get the first one and then the next different kind of degree that you get, then you get another educational merit for that. Um, so that's important to note. But what's really good about it is that you can be earning credits while participating something from the milestone side. And then once you finish um, an actual program, and get that degree, you can then get the educational merit from that. And then the last type of credit um, is the Rehabilitative Achievement Credit, so RAC credits. 
And these are particularly important for community-based organizations because they're awarded to individuals um, for participating in self-help groups. Um, this can be awarded ongoing or if a program has an end date, you can also get um, credit for that. Um, individuals, so this is important because individuals have to be actively participating in groups to receive these credits. Um, and the approval of which groups receive RAC credits is another thing that varies a lot based on each institution. Um, so programs have to get approved for RAC credits um, at each institution it's in. Um, and then you're able, to, an individual is able to earn 10 days off for every 52 hours spent in a RAC approved group. Um, and that maxes out at 40 days off per year. Um, also important to note about RAC credits that if um, incarcerated individuals are running a program inside without a brown card sponsor um, or a staff sponsor, they're not eligible for RAC credits. And um, again, it varies a lot who gets RAC credits and which programs get them. But once you have RAC credits, um, if people are participating, you get, you get credit for that time. Um, and again, this has been kind of a really important piece for the TPW recently because as we're not able to run our programs um, in person, the CDCR has not been awarding any credit for RAC credits. Um, also worth noting that for lifers and youth offenders, um, the credit earning varies. So if someone is, uh, has a life without parole sentence or if they're on death row, they are not eligible to earn credits. Um, and then for youth offenders, as of now, um, credit earning is not, you're not eligible to earn credits um, towards your parole board date. Um, so youth offenders also don't qualify for earning these credits. So some of the things that we want to lift up um, as part of this is to kind of understand from the from the Prop 57 perspective and what the state law mandates. It gives the CDCR a lot of flexibility um, towards dis determining how the policy is actually going to be administered. So in the state law, um, it talks about um, awarding credits under certain conditions to prison inmates that reduce the time they must serve in prison. That's directly from the law itself. And this is one of the things um, that we have been struggling with because um, since CDCR, um, they're the ones who are actually proposing how the policy rolls out, um, it, sometimes that makes it difficult to make changes to the policy or um, advocate for the things that we are needing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, they are able to make changes through the policy, usually through emergency regulations. Um, and again, one of the things that we want to be sure that folks know is that it's really up to them how those changes are rolled out. And um, it's very specifically, you know, the power for this very specifically is with Ralph Diaz. He ultimately has the ability to kind of flip the switch on any type of credit earning. Um, so now we can kind of shift to talk about some of what's been going on with community-based organizations um, in this time of COVID and how this has impacted some of what we're doing um, in general, kind of some of what the TPW is doing. So again, TPW is made up of 40 plus community-based organizations that run in-prison programs all throughout the state of California. We represent uh, members who are, have a presence in all of the California state prisons, all 35. Um, and the TPW as a work group has um, been operating as a united front in front of the legislature and the CDCR to help 
kind of shift, you know, how people are thinking about folks who are incarcerated, how folks are thinking about prison programming, and um, really kind of bring to the light the service that many of these programs are providing towards rehabilitation and healing, and again, working towards our North Star goal of decarceration. Um, so in light of COVID-19, you know, we've seen many organizations have been pivoting to try and meet the needs of folks inside and our program participants. Um, many organizations have shifted to corresponding via mail. Um, and we have had many, many barriers and obstacles to doing that successfully. So the TPW has taken on a role of kind of facing the CDCR, bringing up demands and negotiations, requests um, for how we are able to run our program successfully and to try and ensure that even though we're not able to physically go inside a prison right now to deliver programs, that all of the folks who are incarcerated in California continue to have access. Um, and um, another thing to note about the TPW, again, we um, have a leadership team that um, has various committees um, that are focused on things such as advocacy, specifically kind of building a new narrative around incarceration um, and then mobilizing. So we have focus groups working in all of those areas. So some of those areas include our, um, besides our leadership team, we have a few committees that are working on, on um, different kinds of uh, projects. We have research and communication. Um, we have an advocacy, advocate, advocacy committee and a mobilization committee that are doing work to um, provide information to our members as well as um, organizing um, our members to see what kind of advocacy and action needs to be taken, um, as well as to see what kind of messaging um, we need to do, whether it's to funders or to the CDCR um, or to other stakeholders. And also we love doing things like this, collaborating with groups that are also doing this kind of work and seeing where we can leverage our collective power um, to make changes within the system. Um, as you can imagine, because of um, COVID-19, there have been a, a lot of pauses to the work that our members have been doing. And initially, you know, we were involved in advocating for shifting um, resources to the groups who are part of our membership. So things like um, helping to secure $5 million in permanent funding for programs. Um, and this, this, that, that um, happened last year and it resulted in um, the, the development of the CARE grants. And what was really great about that is not only were we able to actually help get that, get that money for the uh, groups who are our members, but we also um, helped, um, we had a hand in helping in the development of the community that decides where that money is going. Um, and that's really important because we had certain criteria that we felt um, were going to be crucial for ensuring that the money went to where it was supposed to go. But now in these current times, because there's so much um, desire and, and sort of like angst from our members about what's happening with their programming, we've really shifted our organizing towards making sure that the programs that have been providing all of uh, the services that we've been talking about are still able to do that. And our conversations with, um, with the CDCR have been open, but they've been challenging in some ways um, because they're dealing with a lot of things and we're trying to really um, push advocacy for our own groups. But um, as you can imagine, we haven't been able to get everything we, that we want. Um, so we've been diligently working and organizing um, with our members and other groups to kind of see what we can do and um, the ideas that we have for um, how to ensure that programming continues and people are able to get credits are on the next slide. So some of the um, things that um, we've kind of been talking about are ways to ensure that even with 
um, uh, you know, the limited distancing, the social distancing that is required. And really what happened from the beginning um, of the pandemic is that programs, folks who are volunteers of these programs, um, uh, employees of the community-based organizations were just straight up not allowed to go um, into um, the facilities anymore. Um, as was the case with people who are visiting loved ones and, um, and trying to provide other kinds of services. So we really had to try to think and be creative and get feedback from our members to think about like in, in, in this time of social distancing and all of these limitations, how can we still um, be able to deliver the programming so that there is no negative impact on the folks who are inside? So I'm gonna pass it off to um, Ayla who's gonna start. Um, so again, these are these are some of the demands that you know are based on what organizations have determined they need to run the programs, and these are things that we have already taken to the CDCR to ask for, um, but have gained, gotten you know very little traction with them. So we've um, pushed for um, expanding access to tablets. Um, and iPads, ways that programming can be delivered remotely. Um, we, you know, kind of, they, we've seen this happen in some institutions. We've seen this happening more and more with higher education. Um, and so we are asking for that to be accessible to all uh, individuals inside right now. Um, our next thing is um, JPAN email, so figuring out digital ways that people can continue to correspond. Um, and JPAY is a service that is, that is inside. It's a private company that offers the opportunity for um, email correspondence, but right now it does cost money. So um, one of the things, and, and the programs um, that we're talking about, the community-based organizations that are running these programs are not really allowed to use that as well. So um, figuring out how we can open up that service for correspondence and also figuring out ways to make it free, which is complex, but nothing is impossible um, <laughs> when, you really, when you really push for it. Um, because we think also like offering folks an option, uh, the, the option only to have a service that you can only pay for, like people are not gonna turn it down if they wanna be in communication with their loved ones. So it's not really an option, I would say. Um, so figuring out ways of expanding that and making sure that there's not one um, group that has a monopoly is another way to um, expand ways people can be engaged. And then um, Ella had kind of talked about correspondence a little bit, but this is a huge barrier for programs right now because based on how the CDCR's rules currently read, um, any program provider is not supposed to talk directly through mail um, with any group participant. So again, in light of COVID-19, that's exactly what we are trying to do. We want to stay in touch with our group participants. We want to be able to um, continue to let them know we're here and send materials, you know, continue this connection that we've already formed. And according to the rules of the CDCR, it's not allowed. So we've been pushing for um, changing that policy and changing some of the language that prohibits um, correspondence between individuals and programs. And then the credits, um, the credits piece that we've talked about a lot, I, I hope that you can see how critical that is for folks to be continuing to get their credits. And we have our eye on ensuring that there's no um, sort of like scenario where if we do get some of the things that we ask for, that it doesn't negatively impact the way that um, the community-based organizations have been able to provide their services. Um, and also, we don't want to, um, you know, negatively impact people getting their credits. So we want to make sure that um, as credits resume, that if people were um, still doing work um, during this time in some way, that maybe they can get retroactive credits. Um, or just making sure that, you know, there, there's already been a disruption. So right now we're working on making sure that things can um, continue um, and that people, if they have been doing some work, because there are some groups that are, that are still able to maneuver, that they're not losing anything in the process. 
And then the last area that we've been pushing for more access in is with video. Um, and so far that's been kind of an expansion of offerings through DRP TV, which is um, institutional television. And um, we, you know, again, are holding space, trying to get more space for organizations to be able to get their content on institutional television and to hopefully use um, institutional television as a means for delivering program materials, connecting with folks inside. Um, and ultimately, we're hoping for the ability and asking for the ability for video conferencing. Um, so that video can actually go both ways instead of just through um, institutional television. So um, as all of this is continuing, you may be asking how you can um, be involved in this struggle that we're in to make sure that folks continue to get their credits. And um, you can certainly reach out to uh, the folks through Initiate Justice or through us at the TBW. But one of the ways that we are really um, hoping to make an impact is also sharing the stories of folks who have experienced programming, whether it's that the programming has stopped or even talking about the impact programming has had um, on their on earning credits. Because one of the things um, that we believe is that it's really hard to ignore personal stories um, and to ignore people's experiences. And so one of the things that we're doing right now is beginning to collect that information and those stories, which I think we'll talk about a, a, a little later, um, to ensure that you know when we're in front of folks like the CDCR or other legislators in the state, that we are able to accurately represent what, what folks' experiences are on the inside um, and to be able to demonstrate exactly um, how this is impacting them by not being able to get their credits. Thank you, Ellen, Ayla. Um, before I speak about AB 3160 and the legislative solution that the Ella Baker Center, Initiate Justice and Restore Justice co-sponsored this year, I'd like to provide some context from my perspective as a person who was recently incarcerated regarding programming incentives. Almost 10 years ago, federal judges ruled that California's carceral system was cruel and unusual due to its excessive overcrowding, lack of capacity to provide basic medical care. The judges ruled that investing more money into our legal system was not a viable option because that would really just be kicking the can down the road. CDCR was ordered by the courts to reduce their incarcerated population and after losing all court appeals, settled on using rehabilitative programming as an incentive for people to earn time off of their sentences. It's in this context that all of the programming that we've been discussing came to be. I just want to stress CDCR did not create rehabilitative programming, uh, so-called self-help groups and pathways for people to earn time off of their sentences because they care about our loved ones and want to see people return home as soon as possible. Instead, CDCR promotes a narrative that places the burden for a person regaining their freedom on their rehabilitation. Something you or I might simply call healing from trauma in our lives or learning how to cope with oppression and this is much different than suggesting our loved ones are somehow broken and need to be fixed. It's very convenient that this narrative justifies increasing CDCR's budget in the name of rehabilitation, even as the amount of incarcerated people decreases. So it's in this context that Prop 57 and this concept of rehabilitative prisons and programming came to be. California's current CDCR secretary, Ralph Diaz, has been vocal in promoting a vision of the state, various community-based organizations joining forces to work to offer programming to rehabilitate our loved ones. Prop 57 gives CDCR the authority to use earning time off of their sentences as an incentive to get people to participate. But as many of you know, a person's ability to earn time off is dictated by the crime they were convicted of. If a person's crime was classified as violent, even if they were convicted 20 years ago and have never been accused of another act of violence since, 
it would still mean that they would earn less time off for taking the same programming as a person who was convicted of a nonviolent crime. Still, the value of Prop 57 is that it allows a person to earn time off of their sentencing if they participate in programming offered by CDCR. But what if that type of in-person programming isn't an option? As many of you also know, the lack of programming in prisons during the current pandemic means our loved ones are not going to be home as soon as possible because their inability to participate in self-help groups. This year, a piece of legislation authored by Assemblymember Mark Stone, co-sponsored by the Ella Baker Center, Initiate Justice and Restore Justice, would have provided a solution, though it's currently on hold this year due to legislators' reduced bill packages. It's called the Evidence-Based Rehabilitation Act. This legislation shifts the focus from a person's conviction towards their growth and participation in self-help programming. It begins with the premise that all should receive the same credit-based incentives if they do the same work. It wouldn't matter if they were convicted of a nonviolent, non-serious, or violent and serious act. If you take the group and do the work, you should receive the same credit. Secondly, the bill directs CDCR to offer programming even when it's not their priority. Prisons would be required to offer credit earning opportunities even in the midst of a lockdown, modified program, or medical quarantine. And this can be done quite easily by the ways that Ella and Ayla expressed earlier. Um, through technology and distance learning, incarcerated people already have access to correspondence and rehabilitative programming through the institutional TV channels. Add to the mix tablets, laptops, and people on the inside can continue their work without interruption. Currently, even though a person can receive material through the mail, they'd still not be able to earn time off of their sentences for the work that they're doing. And to those who believe in the incarcerated people are broken and need to be fixed narrative, I would remind you that our loved ones are still coming home, just at a slower pace due to the pandemic. Don't you want them to have been working on their rehabilitation during this time? Another aspect of the Evidence-Based Rehabilitation Act is that it acknowledges the value of work for rehabilitation. Under our current system, people are only allowed to participate in self-help programming if it doesn't interfere with their work assignments. This piece of legislation would direct CDCR to give rehabilitation achievement credits, RAC credits to people for working at their job assignments. For instance, think of every person you know out here who's still going out to work in the midst of the pandemic. Regardless of whether they are non incarcerated and being forced to do it for financial reasons, or if people on the inside are being coerced to do it by institutional need, it still deserves to be rewarded. If you're working for pennies an hour to keep the prison running, feeding fellow incarcerated folks, cleaning the common areas or making masks, that's a strong sign that you are ready to come home and should be rewarded with time off. As I said earlier, this bill is on hold this year but we are extremely hopeful it will be reintroduced next year. If you wanna support the bill, we ask that you fill out a quick survey. If you have a loved one inside right now, we need data on how this pandemic has affected their ability to earn time off of their sentences. What groups were they in? What was their anticipated release date? What's their release date now? Also, feel free to email me at james at ellabakercenter.org if you'd like for me to get in touch with your loved ones directly. Ultimately, this bill increases the credit earning opportunities for all of our loved ones because it recognizes the value of who they are today, not some past action they've been accused of. These are unprecedented times. And one thing we are seeing is the carceral system's inability to release the thousands of people who could safely reenter our society today. If programming is the only current method that our policymakers can see to demonstrate a person's worth, then let's make sure programming is happening right now. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to our amazing facilitators. Thank you for all the way breaking down how programming and credits works and also like what opportunities we have now to 
um, push CDCR to make sure that folks are still getting credits and having access to programs and um, letting us know what we can do to be involved in the legislative process as well. Um, Greg dropped the link to that survey that James mentioned in the chat box. So please feel free to go ahead and click on it, copy and paste it, put it in your, put it somewhere because um, you're not gonna be able to click it as easily once this is over. But another thing that we can do is go ahead and um, email the link to the folks who are on this call afterwards. But you know, please make sure you do that as soon as possible. Um, James put, James's email address is um, James at Ella Baker Center. There you go. Um, dot org. So if you want to reach out to James to find out how you can get more involved in AB 3160, please do so. Um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and move it over to Q&A. I saw that there were some questions that popped up in the chat box earlier, but I'm not sure if your questions got answered during the process. So, oh Lord, somebody got a whole list here. I would be Caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin's probably typing the whole time. Um, so if you have a question, please feel free to drop them or you can be like Caitlin and, and drop your itemized list. Um, so go ahead, facilitators. I will. I think all of you should be unmuted and I will go ahead and um, pass it over to you to respond to the question. And anybody feel free to jump in or take the questions in whatever order. I'm scrolling back up to see. There was one credit about, there was one question early on about three strikes and credits. And I know that um, three strikes, like folks who have, uh, who are affected by three strikes are able to earn the good time credits. I'm not sure about the other ones. James, do you know if 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 that's avail if all of the other credits are available as well? I'm sorry, what's the question? The question was, um, do the credit programs apply to three strikers? They so do. So, yeah. so three strikers, um, for the most part, earn eighty percent off of their their sentences for good conduct credits, and then they they're eligible for all available milestones and rack credits. I also saw questions in there about extraordinary credits. So extraordinary credit, I don't think that there's a pathway for incarcerated people to request it or lobby for it. It's typically in the instance of someone saving a correctional officer's life or, or um, maybe telling on a huge contraband issue or something like that where they may earn may be deemed worthy by the institution to earn a year off. One of the things though, that we're gonna be promoting in the next couple of weeks is that every person who's a critical worker right now on the inside, they're risking their lives and that's extraordinary conduct and they all deserve the year off for it. So um, suggest like, if, if you're part of any of the, the advisory committees with CDCR, promoted and suggested, because they should all get that time off. There was also a question about um, certifications or licenses for community-based educational programs. Um, and, and for purely educational programs, they're usually going through an institution like a college or a university. So those, in, or, in order for folks to receive not only milestone, but regular credits because a lot of those programs offer credits on the outside as well they have to be accredited just like you know as if you were on the outside um, other kinds of programs some of them are receiving funding um, through various grants um, but there is no there is no specific license um, that they that they necessarily need if they're a community-based organization to be operating programs um, it's just a question of CDCRs um, approving them to be inside offering programs. Mm 
question that just came in about CBOs for membership in TPW. Um, we're open to, you know, any community-based organization that um, is willing to sign on to our values. We have a very clear value statement that states, you know, what we stand for, what we're working towards. And if there's an organization or an individual that is providing programs and wants to be part of what we're doing, um, absolutely they can request to join. Um, and we can send an email address um, in here as well. So if, if you or you know of other programs that might wanna be part of TPW, um, you can reach out to us and, and we're open. Um, there was another question about the status of um, the technology, the initiatives around technology that we mentioned. And as we said, we, we were, we have, we have pitched those ideas to the CDCR and the only place that we've gotten some traction is to kind of do more with DRP TV, Department of Rehabilitation's program television. So with the educational programs and other channels that they have, they've been opening, they've been open to community-based organizations recording more content to provide on those channels, but that's not the same thing as being able to receive credit. It's just content that is available. So on the other fronts, like with tablets and with um, the ability to do video conferencing, um, we have not received a response from the CDCR about our request to expand those. Um, there are lots of folks who already have tablets, so that system is in place. And <clears throat> our proposal is obviously just to expand that. Um, they've talked about having, already having um, plans for that in the works, but that, but in their planning, it was um, maybe several years down the line. Um, and our ask is to accelerate that um, to see how we can, you know, get get a tablet in the hands of every single person potentially to be able to do these programs. But we haven't received a response about that. I would add on to that just a little bit too, that actually in this most recent budget revise um, that the CDCR has actually taken money away from expanding the use of tablets and computers um, in particular for educational programs. So that's really unfortunate. Um, again, it doesn't affect what currently is already in existence within the CDCR, but it just makes it that much harder for us to um, push for that access at least if we're trying to get it paid for by the CDCR. In regard to the question that's asked, are self-help programs and college classes through correspondence separate in terms of earning credits? Self-help programming receives, is eligible for rehabilitative achievement credits. College classes are eligible for educational milestones. Um, there most of the correspondence classes, the college classes that are through correspondence that I'm familiar with, like Coastline or Lassen, um, even though they're correspondence classes, they tend to have in-person proctors for exams and finals. And that's not happening right now because education departments are closed. So it's my understanding that all of the classes that are eligible for educational milestones are on pause right now um, because the, so going back to what I said about um, CDCR's relationship to rehabilitative programming, they look at this earning time off through a security lens and they're terrified of people manipulating the system. So they want to make sure that they have a staff member pr present um, right now currently to approve of all credit earning opportunities. Um, we're advocating that it's unnecessary and that um, people are not faking the work. And I would, I, I, James, you, you phrased that beautifully. And I would add that um, there are ways that folks inside can be holding each other accountable and um, account for those credits and those hours and the time that's being spent. And so I absolutely agree with you that it's a trust factor. Um, not trusting that folks on the inside have the agency to be able to do that work as well, and then figuring out ways for that information to get back to the programs to track it so that people can get the appropriate credits. Um, somebody, I think, also asked about, um, has, has any correspondence gone out to 
groups about restoring credits and not necessarily about restoring credits, but all of our groups were, were asked um, to put together plans and proposals on how they would accommodate for how things are going on now. And folks took a lot of time to sit and come up with detailed plans. We had a webinar um, helping people go through what potential plans would be, what, what correspondence looks like in different kinds of programmings. And so people are like really mobilizing and thinking about how to do this. But on the other end, we haven't received a sort of like widespread response that gives the green light um, and offers a way for um, all of the programs to continue what they're doing. And right now, the community-based organizations are just having to go facility by facility to try to work with different um, administrators within the facilities to make their programs work. And that's really not sustainable. It's a lot more burden on them than being able to get, you know, one kind of like sweeping green light for everybody to be able to do what they need to do. Um, one other thing that um, I think is worth talking about here too is one of the things that came up in our communication with the CDCR about um, getting credit for participation. They didn't seem to think we could prove um, what they would call like meaningful participation. Um, and, you know, again, part of what we have been countering with is that, you know, any sort of communication during this time, as long as it's focused on the program, should be considered meaningful. Um, and I saw some questions kind of in there too about, you know, what is being done, what current advocacy is being done. And, you know, when we, um, heard about James's bill, we were like, hell yes, this is what we've been waiting for. We're going to rally, go hard on this one. And now since that's not live, um, we are considering some other approaches. So again, if this is something you feel really strongly about or you want to rally behind and um, help support restoring some of these credits, um, again, Ralph Diaz holds the power right now. He's able to restore RAC credits through emergency regulations. Um, and so we're hoping to um, find ways to apply a little bit more uh, urgency to him to make those changes. I also wanted to add just really quick onto what James said earlier about, because um, I think you're, you're, when you talked about the context of why this is so important, that was really essential. You know, I've experienced um, folks who I know who have been in fire camp and my program does education. So we train um, folks to teach classes inside with college students um, and students who are inside and people have had to make choices because, you know, CDCR won't let them work and be in school or be in fire camp and um, take classes or do a training. And so it's really prohibitive if um, folks are ready and willing to do these various programs um, when you're uh, butting up against sort of like administrative hassles and scheduling, but then also not making it easy for people to earn the credits that they need. Um, it's very, it's very burdensome. Um, so being able to alleviate that through legislation, but also through policy, through CDCR policy is gonna be critical. Did y'all have a chance to respond to um, Caitlin Henry's questions yet? I just wanna make sure they didn't get lost in all the other <laughs> Okay, I see her list here. So yeah, I talked about the releasing um, any memo or correspondence. Um, and um, from what I understand, um, the CDCR does have a, a, an email newsletter that they send out on a regular basis that has information about uh, updates about what they're doing. And um, there is also um, one that goes out to folks who have grants and are doing and or are doing programs um, that may be a more um, uh, closely knit group of people or um, more um, selective group of people who are getting that information, but they are sending out information um, on a regular basis. And because it's going to um, folks who are doing programming, that's why it may not be on their site. 
but perhaps like reaching out to some of the groups who are doing um, the work inside who are impacted, they may be able to have some answers um, to questions that you have. Then in terms of, um, you know, specifically about access to credits, um, at least in my experiences with the CDCR recently, there really hasn't been much addressing particularly credits. Um, they've addressed, you know, some of these requests that we have for programs and running our programs, but they've kind of been hands off about credits. Um, I got the sense in one of our meetings with the department that, um, they were hesitant, Secretary Diaz was hesitant to make any of these emergency changes because at least at the point in which we were talking to him, he seemed to think things were going to change and we'd go back to running as normal pretty soon. Um, in terms of the 602 appeals, I'm, um, I'm not sure about that. Do you guys know? I so I, I do think that um, it's important to to document things. So 602s are, are good for just in case there, there's a time later on where you want to make sure that your loved one has exhausted all of their remedies. There will probably be no immediate relief from, from a 602, but it's good to make sure things are documented. And I want to go back to the question. I've seen a, like a lot of versions of the question, what about programming in the future? Um, so right now, there's a judge, his name is Tigar, Judge Tigar, who is looking at CDCR's plan for physical distancing during this, this pandemic. And I'm about to drop his um, contact information in the, in the chat. They're having a hearing tomorrow where CDCR is going to promote their, their plan. And if you have a loved one who is having a, a reduced quality of life, who's, who's not able to access programming and rehabilitation, it's good to reach out to Judge Tigard to let him know um, so that they can get a, that judge can get a full vision of what CDCR is doing and what they aren't doing right now. The fact that people are not earning, able to access Prop 57 in a meaningful way right now, the fact that they don't have access to even if they're doing rehabilitative programming through correspondence or, or through the institutional channels, they're not able to be um, to earn the credits that they would normally get for that work. It is really important as a part of the story of what's going on in our current reality. Um, I personally am not optimistic that, that um, organizations will be allowed in um, this year. So that means that based upon our current methods, the CDCR's current methods of rewarding credits, people are not going to have the same opportunities that they had. Therefore, it's, it's important to reach out to, the, um, reach out to the judge, reach out to, um, that's one way that we can have influence and, and weigh in on this. Oh, and, and the other question as it relates to, to federal prisons, um, Prop 57 and, and, the, and the incentive based programming credits, as far as I know, are not a part of the federal system. So um, I don't think very much of what we're talking about right now applies on a federal level. So, and, and going back to Judge Tigar and the question of, of what can programs do in terms of Judge Tigar? What he's looking at is uh, the CDCR's plan to flatten the curve inside. Part of flattening the curve inside is getting people out. You can't really flatten it with the amount and numbers of people that we have inside right now. Uh, one of the, the, the pathway that CDCR has put most of their energy in for people to get out is rehabilitative programming, and that's not running right now. So this is something I think it's important that he knows and hears from, from people about. 
I also think it's worth um, saying again to how, you know, many community based organizations that run in prison programs have pivoted. They are still, you know, in touch with program participants and shifting their programs to be able to run via correspondence. And um, there are many organizations that, you know, still want to be able to provide these services, even though they're not able to physically be inside right now. And so again, there's this, it's kind of stuck on this issue about rat credits and how, um, you know, both sides are willing and ready and doing the work together. So let's just award credit for what they're already doing. Um, and, you know, many organizations, again, kind of based on this unprecedented time, are shifting how they're doing things so that they can continue to provide this type of support for folks inside, kind of no matter what else is going on. In regards to the question about whether the hearing tomorrow will be open to the public via Zoom, I have not seen the link, but if you go to the judge's website, there may be information there. I think that's covered almost everything. It's hard to <laughs> scroll through and see if we, meet, we missed anything, but. Thanks for your great questions, everyone, and for folks who are providing additional information as well to, to supplement what we're saying. Thank you so much. And um, while the TPW at this particular moment in time um, doesn't, we're not quite ready to say exactly what we're going to be doing um, in response to kind of advocating more for RAC credits. This is something that we're actively planning and coordinating on as an organization. Um, but again, if you want to stay in touch with us um, and get to hear what we're going to be doing, we'll be happy to share it out with this network as well. Um, and I put the email in there, it's a ways up, but that's kind of the general TPW um, email for folks. I wanna second my appreciation for the, the um, great questions in the sense of, of community and thanks for to initiate Justice and Taina for hosting this, this Really important topic. Thanks, Ty. Oh, thank you all so much. Um, definitely learned a lot. And I personally am looking forward to seeing the incredible progress that I'm sure TPW is going to make in terms of um, implementing better access to programs and credits. Just really want to emphasize, um, you know, how difficult it is already to work with CDCR and to get um, you know, make sure that they're running the, the programs correctly and making sure everybody is getting the credits that they're entitled to. And given the crisis of this pandemic, um, everything has been exacerbated. So shout out to TPW for really stepping it up and, and fighting hard to make sure that the people are getting the credit where the credit is due. And also shout out to you, James, um, and everybody at EBC and, you know, Restore Justice, who have been working really hard on AB 3160. Um, I also want to shout out Greg on our team, who's our policy associate, who's been the lead on 3160 and has been working really hard on it. So, yeah, um, if there are no more questions, I encourage everybody to take the survey. Um, so that we can have as much accurate information as possible as we move forward in these advocacy efforts. Um, contact information for everybody is here on this slide. So please feel free to reach out. And again, um, this webinar is recorded and it will be posted on the Initiate Justice website in the next couple of days. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, y'all enjoy your evenings. Wish you all the best and thank you so much to our incredible presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Be blessed.